Welcome to NTD China News. I'm Karen Chang. Making headlines this Wednesday, March 20th. Xi Jinping says he wants to facilitate dialogue between South and North Korea. U.S. internet security firm Mandiant testifies about Chinese cyber espionage. And the U.S. Treasury Secretary is in China, but it's not his meetings with Chinese leaders that netizens are talking about. Chinese leader Xi Jinping has spoken with his counterpart in South Korea about the nuclear threat from North Korea. Chinese Foreign Ministry said today the Communist Party chief told South Korea's Park Kyung-hye he is willing to facilitate dialogues between the two. She said peace and stability on the Korean peninsula was also in China's best interest. North Korea has threatened to end an armistice with South Korea that ended a civil war in 1953. Pyongyang is angry over joint military operations between South South Korea and the United States. The Chinese regime is North Korea's biggest ally. Although China supported sanctions against North Korea for its third nuclear test, it says sanctions are not the answer. The Chinese regime has been denying allegations that is behind orchestrated cyber attacks against the U.S. It follows a detailed report by security firm Mandiant. On Tuesday, senior executives from the company faced a U.S. Senate committee and rebutted against China's denial. U.S. internet security company Mandiant has reiterated the threat of cyber attacks from China to a U.S. Senate committee on Tuesday. Last month, the company issued a detailed report pointing to a unit of the Chinese People's Liberation Army as being involved in several high-profile attacks on U.S. companies. A seven-year campaign that pill for millions and billions of documents from hundreds of U.S. companies. It's just hard to fathom that that's a, a real alternative. So we believe there's no valid conclusion other than a unit of the PLA is in fact in charter to compromise the U.S. infrastructure and steal intellectual property. Speaking to the Senate Armed Service Committee on Capitol Hill, Mandian's chief security officer suggests the cyber attacks are largely aimed at gathering trade intelligence. The Chinese regime has a political interest in making sure the economy moves forward as one way to justify its hold on power. The Chinese think in terms of the economic and military being together as a national security concern. China has strongly denied the cyber attack accusations. It says Mandian's research is flawed because it relies solely on using IP addresses to track the source of the attacks. The main Chinese response has been what we call a straw man. It's a fake argument that, that they stand up so that it's easy to, to knock down. The fact that they rely solely on IP addresses or they, or they say that our report is just based on IP addresses is not true. You can read the report. It's free. You can download it and see all the different ways we do the attribution. Mandian's report comes amidst separate cyber attack allegations by U.S. companies that were traced to China. The Obama administration has also spoken strongly since then. National Security Advisor Tom Donilon issued a warning to the Chinese regime to stop the hacking saying the attacks are happening on an unprecedented scale. It's one of the stranger new sensations on China's internet. U.S. Treasury Secretary Jack Liu met with Chinese leader Xi Jinping yesterday, but that's not what grabbed people's attention. Find out how a $17 meal turned into another reason for Chinese netizens to lament over communist officials. Jack Liu, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, is in China for high-level talks with Chinese leaders. But that's not what caught the attention of Chinese netizens. Rather, it was the low-profile lunch Mr. Liu and his three colleagues had on Tuesday. Liu had just finished a meeting with Chinese leader Xi Jinping. Then it was straight to dumplings, cold dishes and tea. The total bill for four? About $17.50. Chinese officials see the reception expense as a symbol to show their power and identity. They use public funds to eat out because people don't have the right to supervise them and have no power to dismiss them. In a country where even low-level officials are known to spend thousands or even tens of thousands of yuan on a single meal, often on the taxpayer's dime, people are shocked. Some Nessens even joke that they'd be able to treat a top U.S. official to lunch. Jack Liu's $17 lunch comes as Chinese leader Xi Jinping promises to cut back on extravagance and corruption within the Communist Party. But it may be a while to go before Chinese officials will happily chow down on cheap dumplings. 
A Chinese state-owned mining company in the U.S. is making headlines in Tennessee. The state is considering whether to ban mountaintop removal. Concerns over the practice of this type of mining activity have prompted a TV campaign by a conservative political group. A group in the United States called the Tennessee Conservative Union released an advertisement on Monday. The ad supports proposed state legislature that would ban mountaintop removal for virgin peaks over 2,000 feet. But behind the ad is concerned that a Chinese-owned mining company, which has surface rights to about 48 square miles, would cause damage to Tennessee's mountains. Tennessee has become the first state in our great nation to permit the red Chinese to destroy our mountains and take our coal. The same folks who hold our debt, hack our businesses, and have the worst conservation record in the world. Triple H Coal Company was bought by Chinese state-owned Guizhou Guochang Energy Holdings last year. This was the first Chinese acquisition of a U.S. coal company, and a top Chinese CEO in the coal industry said Chinese coal companies were interested in further acquisitions. While TCU is worried about the destructive practice of mountaintop removal, it is also concerned over Chinese companies with a poor environmental record acquiring U.S. assets. We're proud that Tennessee is a red state, but just how red are we willing to go? Environmentalist group Appalachian Voices points out that while the coal is mostly sent to other states now, it may not be that way for long. Last year, the U.S. sent 12 percent of U.S. coal overseas. And as alternatives to coal become cheaper in the U.S., the group predicts that percentage will increase. It also warns that if the coal industry becomes more international, the profits from Tennessee coal will go overseas while the pollution will stay at home. And coming up after the break, China's tallest building is hit by a building quality scandal. After weeks of pollution, Beijing residents finally get a moment of reprieve, and Shen Yun is connecting the people of France to Chinese culture. And welcome back. Concrete made with sea sand is believed to have been used in the construction of China's tallest building. The project has now been suspended, but the discovery raises further concerns over building quality in China. The Ping'an International Finance Center in Shenzhen is among many buildings being sampled. It's part of an industry-wide investigation initiated by Shenzhen's Housing and Construction Bureau. According to the statement by the Bureau, 31 companies were found to have used concrete mixed with sea sand. Sea sand is much cheaper than river sand and can help developers to cut costs. But using concrete made with sea sand can seriously affect construction quality. The salt and chloride in sea sand corrode steel reinforcements. This could ultimately cause the building to collapse. But the problem won't be apparent immediately. Experts say it could take decades for the building to become condemned. The Ping'an Center is being built by Chinese state-owned China State Construction Engineering Corps. According to Bloomberg News, the company says its building materials meet quality standards. An official from China's ocean monitoring body has delivered a grim report about the country's coastal lines. More and more of the seashores are becoming polluted, so much so they can now only be used for industrial purposes. China's State Oceanic Administration released data on Wednesday saying that China's coastal sea suffers from severe pollution. The area of nearshore affected by pollution increased by 35 percent in 2012. China's nearshore environmental problems are still severe. They mainly arise from the excessive discharge of terrestrial pollutants and river pollutants. Over 26,000 square miles of coastal seawater is only suitable for use as seaports and for oceanic development. That is the very lowest rating, and the area affected is 9,000 more square miles than 2011 figures. Alarmingly, the report adds that over 67,000 square miles of coastal seawater is unsuitable for marine fisheries or marine nature reserves. The report goes on to say that 7,000 square miles of nearshore water is affected by eutrophication. That's caused when excess nutrients pollute a body of water. After weeks of choking air, Beijing residents got a chance to feel good about their city. What happened on Tuesday that made locals and tourists actually want to enjoy the outdoors? Let's find out. It was a welcome relief to Beijing's 20 million residents. 
After some of the worst air pollution in recorded history, a gentle snow began falling earlier today, blanketing the city in a soft layer of white and leaving the sky a crystal blue. I'm really happy about the snow today. It's a change from before. I read on the Weibo microblog that many people took photos at the Forbidden City. The previous muggy weather did make me upset, but the snow is cheering me up. Tourists came out in droves to take photos of some of Beijing's most iconic scenic spots, like the Badaochu Park, the Yongding Tower, and the Badaling Great Wall. And of course, there were the resilient plum blossoms, their soft reds standing out in a sea of white, blooming long after other flowers have faded and fallen. Even the air over heavy traffic lanes seemed serene. And after the kind of pollution Beijing had earlier in the year, this was nothing to sneeze at. The French Renaissance between the 15th and 17th century was a cultural rebirth for Europe. Over the weekend, locals got to experience another renaissance, this time of China's ancient culture. Shen Yun Performing Arts gave a single performance in the theater of Wuhubei on the evening of March 16th. The audience felt a strong connection between the performance and the spiritual aspect of the Chinese culture that the show conveys. Messages of love, generosity, purity are played out on the stage. It then dawns on you that universal values come through in every scene of ways to help one another, of being generous. And there is also something mystical, something that makes you think about the meaning of life, about eternal life, about the Creator. This is a word that comes up often. And there is also messages of tolerance being played out. The emotional experience and dynamic backgrounds of Shen Yun made a government official feel like she was a part of the show. I was all in tears at the start of the show. My tears just kept falling because it's true that I have faith. So it brought me closer, if you like spirituality, to this divine faith. So I was in tears because there is a force, a power. My heart was really moved, enormously. I really believed that I was in there for real somehow. The fact that the dancers and performers appear inside the multimedia scenery, then come back to us on stage, then enter the scenery again, that is the transcendental part. Myself, I wanted to follow them so I could find such peace, an inner peace. So I said to myself, well, a big thank you. Others found purity and hope in the divine connection that Shen Yun provides. These magnificent dances that we've just seen, in fact, they bring the glorification of the divine in us. And that's what I deeply feel. Energy, respect, pure vibrations, without ulterior motives, without commercial purpose, without money issues, pure self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice has no nation, no nationality. Through poetry, music, dance and wonderment, we finally find our common roots, those of humanity, filling people with wonder, awakening the hearts. That is the path of hope, in my opinion, when compared to our complex modern world. The next stop on Shane's European tour is Berlin, German, with three shows on March 22nd to 24th. And that's all we have time for for this NTD China News. For more about China-related content, visit our website at ntd.tv or subscribe to our YouTube channel, NTD on China. Coming up next is a segment of the nine commentaries on the Communist Party. Stay tuned. <laughs>